Hey, good day, everybody, and welcome to your live event. My name is Eric Weinkoop, and I'm the Director of Culinary Instruction here at Ruby. I'm also one of the chef instructors in your courses uh, all throughout the, the spectrum of our offerings here, along with my uh, culinary uh, you know, chef instructor team members here. And uh, today's uh, live event theme is office hours. So uh, welcome to my office hours. Uh, this is your chance to ask uh, any question, really, uh, that pertains to food and cooking. And uh, as always, I'll ask you to uh, keep your questions within that realm rather than straying into uh, nutrition and, and medicine and other uh, sort of allied you know, fields to food. We'll, we'll stick to the, the, the cooking themes here. And I'll do my best to answer your questions. Uh, if it turns out that you've got some additional questions or follow up, uh, feel free to send those in. Uh, to me at support at ruby.com, and I'd be happy to get back to you. Uh, also, as you're moving through your courses and you come up with a question that pertains to a given task, uh, please use the Q&A function in that given task, and then uh, that'll make its way uh, to me, and uh, I can respond you know, and that'll be recorded specifically with that task. I appreciate that. Uh, as we get started today, uh, just a couple of uh, little housekeeping items here. You'll see already on the right-hand side of your screen a whole list of questions uh, that have already been entered by our viewers today. And if you'd like to contribute to that list, uh, please take a look at the, uh, the gray box at the top of the right-hand side of your screen that says add question here. Go ahead and type in your, your question or your comment and that'll make its way to me during this program. Uh, and then also uh, note that in the individual question box on the right-hand side, you'll see a heart-shaped icon. And if you would like that particular question addressed a little bit sooner than later, then you can click on that icon and it'll bump it up uh, in the queue. Uh, but please rest assured that I will get to all the questions today. All right. Uh, so, without further ado, let me go ahead and jump on in and uh, address your questions. So, the first one, this is from Jen. I'm wondering if there will be a list of food items needed for the week ahead as we progress through the course. Uh, thank you, and I'm looking forward to what I'll be learning. Excellent. Um, so, the, the quick question at this, or the quick answer, rather, at this point, Jen, is that uh, we will ask you... Uh, to click ahead a couple of tasks, maybe a couple of three tasks, and based upon your pace, and see what activities come up regarding practice uh, recipes that you, know, you can follow through uh, on your own in your kitchen, uh, as well as photo upload cooking assignments that will make their way to our chef instructor team here for critique and feedback. All right. And we ask you to, to jump ahead, uh, you know, again, two, three, four, five tasks or so, um, because your pace will be unique. And also the recipes that you will choose uh, will be unique to, you know, your palate preference and maybe what's available to you from your garden or your grocery store. And uh, so your shopping list will be a little bit different. The quantity that you will purchase uh, will be tailored to your own situation, whether it's just you or, you know, your extended family that you might be cooking for. Uh, so everyone's situation is a little bit uh, different. And because of those variables, we ask you to, to, uh, to just take a peek ahead and then and do some planning at your pace. All right. Thank you. All right. Next up. Uh, hello, Usha. Uh, says, I am a big user of Instapot and Vitamix. I'm hoping we will be shown how to incorporate these in our cooking. Ah, okay. So, yeah, so a, a great question. Um, so, you know, indeed, uh, there are a number of uh, preparations, a number of recipes uh, that uh, call for blending of, of some sort. 
And so this is where your Vitamix blender or whatever you know, brand you might be using, BlendTech, for example, um, will come into play. And, you know, we don't look at uh, or, or discuss the operation of the equipment specifically uh, for something like an Instapot, okay, which is uh, an electronic uh, pressure cooker. Uh, and then the Vitamix, right, which is a blender. Uh, my, you know, I think, you know, best suggestion would be to take a look at the uh, user's manual uh, that comes with each of these pieces of equipment, as well as the uh, recipe booklets uh, that accompany these pieces of equipment. And if you work through those, uh, they will give you the best um, avenue to becoming familiar, first of all, with the equipment. And then you will start to see, you know, how to incorporate that into your day and your week in the kitchen. Okay. Um, that certainly was my approach with the Instapot uh, and, uh, you know, high-speed blenders. Um, and then otherwise, you know, we'll focus on other methods and techniques that are allied, right, to those machines. All right. Thank you. All right, next up uh, from Lorena. Good day. Uh, I'd like your input on this. Uh, thawed frozen food, can it be refreeze? Uh, so quick answer is yes, but I'll qualify that in a, in a second. Uh, if I make a sorbet using frozen berries plus maple, squeeze of lemon or coconut milk, uh, and some is left, uh, can I put it back in the freezer? I'm worried about bacteria. Okay. Um, so yeah, the, the quick uh, answer is that yes, absolutely. Foods can be refrozen. Uh, keep in mind a couple of things. The the first one is regarding quality, and uh, you know, as things uh, freeze and are thawed, uh, especially you know, vegetable matter, uh, the the structure softens, and that's because water expands as it's frozen. As the water expands, it, it ruptures the cell walls. As that food is thawed, there's less structure provided by that uh, that now sort of looseness right in uh, in that uh, in that tissue structure. Uh, but you can certainly put it back in the freezer and uh, incorporate it, uh, you know, into your cooking at a later time. Now, regarding the food safety aspect, right, and the growth of pathogens, you know, do keep in mind that. Uh, when you freeze items, those uh, microorganisms don't die. Rather, they just slow down. Their metabolism uh, comes, uh, maybe not to a stop exactly, but it, but it does slow down. And that's what provides you the extra shelf life on the product. Now, when you go to thaw that product, then those items become more active, those, those microorganisms. Okay, so because of that, we need to be aware of the, the time that the food uh, is thawed, right, or in the refrigerator, and certainly when it's at room temperature, uh, because the uh, activity is going to increase quite a bit in terms of multiplication of microorganisms. So uh, there's a running clock in other words, uh, so if, for example, if you had your, your items in the refrigerator for uh, a couple of days um, and then you froze it and then you brought it back out of the freezer for a couple of more days, then you need to add those together. So two days before or you know, earlier and then two days again this time. So you have a total of four days now where those uh, foods and those microorganisms um, are in the refrigerator and able to multiply, okay? Um, now, uh, the overall shelf life in terms of spoilage is, you know, usually about a week. Um, call it five or six or seven days, sometimes a little bit more, sometimes a little bit less, depending on the food item. And so, that's what I keep in mind as I pull things in and out of the freezer, um, but trying to limit that to maybe just a couple of times, uh, because uh, as I mentioned earlier, quality starts to decline. Um, you know, flavors become dull and, and colors might darken. Uh, and those are often changes that I, I, I want to mitigate. And uh, so I try to limit that uh, 
freeze thaw cycle to maybe just a couple of times okay but uh, yeah certainly um, if, if you're not going too long uh, you know in the danger zone or in the fridge then you're going to be fine in, in the danger zone you know uh, you know think about uh, you know th three or four hours or so as uh, you know, being reasonable and then you want to start to, to be more vigilant beyond that and then in the refrigerator again just as a review uh, maybe five six seven days or so uh, would be considered reasonable for most food items. All right, thank you. All right, next up, uh, what tips would you give to develop your creativity in the kitchen? Uh, how do you get over the, the fear of failing in the kitchen or not being good enough as an aspiring chef? Aha, so these are very interesting questions. Um, so the first one, in terms of developing creativity in the kitchen, uh, I, I take at least a two-pronged approach. I mean, one is to familiarize myself with uh, an array of ingredients uh, and, uh, you know, cooking uh, methods, food handling techniques, uh, and also regional cuisines, right? So regional cuisines give me uh, some idea of how to start bringing together uh ingredient and flavor combinations, texture combinations. Okay. So that's going to be a starting point. So just it's, it's education uh, at that first, uh, first stage. And then the second part of that for me uh, is to get into the kitchen and uh, practice, right? So to hone my skills and to deepen my understanding of all that food product around me um, is going to give me more control. And, uh, you know, that also leads to, of course, confidence uh, around food preparation. All right. So, um, you know, once you develop uh, your skill set and your knowledge base, then that frees you from recipes uh, in a big sort of way. Not that recipes uh, become absent in your life, but rather than being a path that constrains you, uh, they become just a point of uh, inspiration. So you might look at something and uh, you know recognize a flavor profile, and then you look at your refrigerator and see that you've got some of those ingredients, but not all of them. And then you can f you, you will understand how you can um, you know tailor that dish based upon what you do have. All right, and that's that's part of that development of creativity. So practice. Uh, is a big part of that. So there's the the skill development, which comes with practice, right? And uh, that's going to spawn more practice uh, in the kitchen. So that package of activity there, for me, uh, leads to creativity, all right? Um, also, you know, maybe a, a third prong that I'll add would be to look at other people's work, uh, you know, whether they're amateurs that you admire or whether they're professionals that you admire, take a look at their style of work um, and, uh, you know, find those couple of three individuals that uh, um, that you align with and, you know, try to, you know, first of all, uh, maybe replicate some of what they're making so you can understand where they're coming from. And then again, you can take that next next step. Uh, of doing your own thing, okay? And then uh, the next part of your question is uh, a pretty big question here, and that is how do you get over the, the, the fear of failing in the kitchen and not being you know, good enough as, as, as an aspiring cook or aspiring chef? Um, you know, the, uh, uh, I think a big part of that foundation uh, is based upon what I just talked about, and it's the confidence, right, that comes from your understanding of ingredients uh, your skill development, which comes with practice and repetition, right? So doing that same activity many, many times makes you better at that. And uh, that's going to be true of any activity, right? Whether it's basketball or playing the piano, um, you got to uh, hit those notes or, or dribble up and down the court repeatedly um, in order to get better. And so the same thing in cooking. Uh, knife skills are huge. Controlling the uh, uh, fire and temperature, uh, or fire and, and time, rather, uh, are uh, you know, foundational parts of uh, the cooking experience. And so you do that over and over, and it takes time. So be patient with yourself, and uh, you know, without fail, you will be better, more confident, 
And that, uh, you know, that fear of failure starts to decline. Okay. Uh, and then, you know, as you cook for other people, right, they're going to give you feedback. And, uh, many, you know, many people will like your cooking. And that also feeds that, uh, that base of confidence. And that continues to whittle away any sense of failure uh, or fear of failure that you might have. Okay. And this idea of not being good enough as an inspiring chef, I think, um, you know, uh, at some point, probably, you know, we all have a little touch of that, maybe some of us more than others. Um, but that's all something that's made up right in our own minds. And I think that's important to, uh, to realize that first of all. And um, if, if there's one exercise that uh, is, uh, I think, helpful uh, addressing those sort of uh, larger uh, anxieties is uh, um, meditation. And uh, as, as odd as that might sound uh, here uh, during Ruby's uh, live event, uh, I think meditation can go a long way in bringing calm uh, to what you do in the kitchen. And, uh, you know, understand, uh, you know, once again, that everything's relative and, you um, uh, you know, you're, you're going to be uh, much, you know, in, in quotes, better, right, than others, right, in terms of your skill development. But there's always going to be somebody else that has more experience, more understanding, and they might be a little bit better, right, in, in quotes, uh, than you are, right, as an aspiring cook and chef. But, uh, you know, you, you keep on moving up that, uh, that ladder or across that spectrum, and those, uh, those anxieties, those fears go away. All right. Have fun with it. Thank you. Uh, next up from John. Uh, is there a section in the course uh, which covers grains? Uh, you know, which need to be soaked or not uh, and how long? OK, so, um, yes, there certainly are um, our regular courses. So in other words, our, our longer experiences, uh, you know, do address grains. Uh, they all address them in different places, of course, but uh, in any different ways. But um, in um, the Culinary Rx course, for example, it's a unit five uh, that touches upon grain cookery. And then you'll find those topics in, in other units and in other, other courses. Um, now, in terms of soaking or not, uh, it, it depends. It really depends on what you're making and what sort of method or technique that you want to employ. Uh, you know, generally speaking, if you're working with whole grains, you know, grains that have the bran layer intact, then uh, it's good to soak, uh, in my opinion. Uh, it gives the, the grain a chance to absorb some of that liquid and to start to soften, especially that tougher outer bran layer. Uh, in terms of how long you might soak for uh, whole grains, they're very flexible. Generally speaking, um, I will look ahead to the next day, which means that I'm soaking overnight. Um, but certainly a few hours, you know, it might be three, four or five hours, uh, you know, could be adequate for, uh, for getting the job done later on in the day as well. Okay. For uh, polished rice or white rice, as an example, uh, you know, soaking for 20 or 30 minutes is my usual practice. Um, but, um, you know, on occasion, I, I don't, soak. Again, it just depends on the preparation uh, that I might be preparing. Okay. Um, so, you know, start with that. Again, understanding that if it's whole grains, that uh, you can let things soak for two or three days if you want to. Okay. In the heat of the summer, I recommend changing the water each day uh, just to keep that fresh because otherwise you get a lot of um, uh, bacterial growth, uh, you know, in that water. Okay, but otherwise, uh, there's a lot of flexibility. All right, thanks, John. All right, next up, uh, how should we organize our time to make sure we finish the tasks on time? Okay, great. Um, you know, this is uh, you know always a concern for me when I enter uh, a longer course, and you know, looking at uh, especially our six-month courses, our, our professional plant-based course and our professional cook course uh, here at Ruby. Uh, those are, uh, you know, about 500 tasks, plus or minus a little bit, and six months in duration. So it's really important to stay on top of the time management and your pacing uh, so that you don't fall behind. And, you know, very simply what I do is I look at the total task count, 
and I will divide right by the number of months that I have or the number of weeks that I have, um, and then uh, you know uh, attack those tasks uh, in those smaller clusters. Okay, and then maybe a third of the way through, and certainly by the halfway point. I will reassess where I am in terms of progress and pace. So I'll look at what is remaining in the course in terms of task count, as well as the time, uh, you know, to uh, the, the the six month mark, and then I'll I'll do that uh, math once again, that that division to figure out what my pace needs to be on a daily basis or a weekly basis uh, to finish on time. All right. So give that a try. Thank you. All right, next up from Robert. Uh, what are your thoughts on the preferred material regarding your large main pan? I have a non-stick uh, Swiss diamond, uh, but wonder if a healthier choice would be a stainless steel. Um, well, um, you know, my preference generally for a my, my main sort of daily go-to pan or, or a couple of pans is something that's not non-stick, um, you know, only because uh, um, non-stick surfaces, uh, in my experience anyway, tend to be uh, a little bit uh, fragile, you know, comparatively so. Uh, whereas with something like stainless steel or cast iron, you know, I can bang around with it and uh, use different utensils and uh, not have to uh, really be uh, concerned with leaving scratches uh, on the surface. So, you know, because of that, uh, I tend to use those two materials, stainless steel, and uh, we've got a couple of um, iron pans uh, that are the, our go-to pans here at home. And, you know, they're relatively easy to maintain, uh, and they're going to last a lifetime too, okay? And so that's going to be my quick feedback there. And then I, you know, we've got, certainly we have a, a stainless or a, a non-stick pan, maybe a couple of them. Uh, that we'll use once in a while for you know more um, a more narrow range of cooking. All right, thank you. All right, next up, uh, chef versus cook. What's the difference between the two, and what should a culinary student aspire to be? Okay, uh, yeah, this is a fun question for me, and uh, I'll certainly give you you know my perspective on the use of of these terms. Um, when it, I'll start with the term uh, cook, right? Uh, if you prepare food, you're a cook. And that includes um, uh, someone who has the, the title of chef in the professional life. They also are a cook, okay? Uh, so we're all cooks. And you know, certainly if you're, uh, if you're cooking as, um, uh, I'll say, focused on home cooking, right? I.e. it's not your profession, then you're not a chef, you're a cook. Um, uh, chef is a professional term, and it uh, is going to refer to somebody who uh, makes some money at it. Um, you know, whether it's your full-time gig or a part-time gig, you can aspire to that um, level of responsibility. Uh, a chef occupies a management position in a food service operation. Uh, regardless of the style of operation. I mean, it could be a hotel or a restaurant or uh, a cafe or some other style of establishment, but uh, a chef has a responsibility of um, budgeting and uh, hiring and firing labor and uh, uh, calculating food cost, uh, turning a profit and marketing and these various and sundry uh, activities that are associated with the management of an operation, okay? So at home, you know, we do some of that, but we don't worry about the full spectrum of that. Uh, therefore, in my opinion, the term chef does not apply to somebody who uh, it, uh, cooks at home, regardless of how good you are. Uh, you know, I have certainly met a lot of home cooks that are fabulous, and they can cook circles uh, around, um, you know, others that cook professionally. Um, but um, it's a little bit different again in terms of you know where you're doing your work, and so that's how I draw the line between the terms you know chef and cook. Okay, I hope that's uh, uh, that's helpful for you, Tony. All right, um, and you know, so you know what should a culinary student aspire to be? I think if um, you're aspiring to be 
the, the best darn home cook on the block, then you're going to be the best cook on the block. But if you aspire to uh, cook professionally and to move into positions of management and to maybe own your business, uh, then, you know, at some point someone's going to call you a chef. And uh, then, you know, that's, uh, that's the path that you're on. All right. Thanks. All right. Next up. Uh, I am nearing the end of my plant-based pro course and would like to thank all the Ruby instructors for, for providing excellent support throughout the course. Uh, thank you, Arti. Uh, we always appreciate the feedback. And, uh, it, you know, even more than that, it's so nice to know that you have found benefit uh, in your Ruby experience. Uh, what are your thoughts about using MSG in your food? Do you use it while cooking at home? Uh, I don't use it at home, although I did grow up with it. I grew up in Japan and, you know, back in the 70s, having a shaker of um, um, Ajinomoto, right, or MSG uh, on the table uh, was there uh, in, in place of a salt shaker. Um, that eventually, you know, became less popular in, in, uh, in uh, places in, in Asia, um, I don't have a shaker of MSG on the table, but, um, you know, I'll leave, really leave that up to the consumer. Um, you know, I, uh, uh, I guess I haven't even thought about it uh, in, a, in a really long time. But um, some people have some uh, concerns about MSG and, and others don't. Um, you know, from the, uh, uh, the, the research community, there isn't any um, sort of uh, specified uh, issues that are related to MSG. But again, if someone experiences concerns, you know, issues around MSG, then I consider those to be real for that person. And it's probably warranted for that person to uh, minimize or to avoid uh, MSG. So, you know, some things to think about. Um, I don't have a problem with it necessarily, but I don't use it at home. All right, thank you. All right, next up. Uh, how can you make sure each person is getting enough protein daily on the whole food plant-based diet without having to calculate it daily? Uh -huh. So uh, my quick uh, response is that uh, there really is no concern uh, with protein quantity for most people most of the time on a whole food plant-based diet, uh, so long as you know we're enjoying a varied diet. And I think that's really the key. Um, because all plants uh, contain amino acids, and the amino acids are the building blocks for protein. And the body does all the building. You just need to give them the building blocks. And the building blocks, again, are going to come from the variety of foods that you consume. Okay? And then uh, leave it to the intelligence of our bodies to take care of the protein uh, construction and fulfilling those, uh, those needs. Um, you, know, you know, generally speaking, uh, as, as I mentioned, most people aren't going to have a problem meeting those protein requirements, uh, you know, on a whole food plant-based diet. And there's, I think, plenty of studies that have been, have been conducted uh, that will uh, talk to that, that will, uh, you know, uh, affirm or, or, you know, reassure a person that, uh, you know, indeed, plants provide that spectrum of amino acids. Okay, thank you. Uh, next up, uh, hello, Roya. Uh, is TVP, textured vegetable protein, considered whole food? Uh, sometimes I use non-GMO TVP in my stew and wonder if it is healthy. Uh, so the quick answer is no. Uh, TVP is a, a processed food. It is a, a derivative of... Um, oftentimes uh, soybeans, but it could be from other uh, sources as well. Um, so it is not considered a whole food, but it is uh, certainly popular, right, within the the whole food uh, plant, the plant, the plant-based community, I should say. Um, now you use an, an interesting term here, uh, you know, non-GMO, right, TVP, and I'll quickly say that um, um, that's. Uh, you know, arguably a good thing, right, to use non-GMO TVP as an option, um, you know, especially, you know, as m much of the TVP comes from uh, soy beans. And at least in the United States, by far, uh, the majority of soybeans are, um, are, are GE product. And if one wants to avoid that, then uh, it requires that you uh, uh, reach for the, the non-GMO varieties on the shelf. 
Um, and then, uh, you know, otherwise, yeah, just as a, a reminder to everybody, you know, do keep in mind that uh, GMO or non-GMO foods, uh, you know, versus uh, organic or certified organic foods, right, uh, versus whole foods, right, uh, the, these different concepts are independent from one another. And so because you buy one or eat in one area doesn't mean that uh, you're getting the other. Okay. And there's uh, certainly a, a lot to read and a lot to understand, um, you know, covering these, uh, just these three areas that I touched upon here, but very interesting subject area. All right. Thank you. All right. Next up from Brenda, uh, with air fryers becoming more popular, are there any plans or any reason to add a section using one? Um, you know, my quick response is that, uh, at least here at Ruby, you know, we don't have uh, plans to create a lesson around the air fryer. Um, the air fryer is a, a really interesting piece of equipment and very convenient in many ways. And, you know, as I mentioned earlier in today's program, uh, you know, in terms of using the air fryer and incorporating that into your daily and, and weekly repertoire of cooking, you know, my first recommendation is to become familiar with the manufacturer's guidelines, right? Um, in, of course, on, on the operation side, but also, you know, work through the recipe booklet that comes with that piece of equipment so you can understand what the manufacturer intends. I think that's the best place to start. Then once you understand and, and develop, develop some confidence around that equipment, you can see how to incorporate it more generally in all of the cooking that you do, okay? And, uh, you know, you can start to see ways to adapt Ruby recipes or any other recipe to the air fryer. All right, thank you. All right, next up. Uh, when recipes call for uh, large onion or medium tomato, medium zucchini, how does one know the size of this description? Uh, maybe it doesn't matter, just subjective in nature. Uh, so Darlene, yes, uh, that is really a wide open question because these terms small, medium, and large do not have a standard, All right? So and certainly if you travel the world, you know, you will see um, just hugely different standards for these different words. And uh, so uh, it becomes difficult sometimes, right? When you first approach a recipe to understand just what size of produce you might choose at the grocery store or pluck from your garden. Um, so it is uh, subjective to answer your, the third part of your question. Um, does it matter? You know, it does, uh, certainly, right, in terms of the balance of textures and, and tastes and flavors in a given dish. And that is going to come with uh, practice, of course, okay? Now, if you're in a, in a given region, right, or given country, you can find some guidelines uh, on what small or medium or large probably means, again, it might not be 100% accurate, but you, you can find some guidelines. Um, you know, I would recommend that you uh, do a Google search uh, for some guidelines on, uh, you know, what that means in your particular region, and then start from there, okay? But again, um, getting back to, you know, what I just mentioned around experience, um, you know, you're going to uh, pretty quickly, right, with some practice uh, in the kitchen, uh, come to understand uh, the effects of tomatoes, right, or the effects of onions in a given recipe, and you will learn to adjust uh, up or down based upon your preference and your des desired outcomes, okay? And that's going to be true uh, even with this subjectivity, or even if it were very specific, like if, if the recipe called for uh, eight ounces of onion, you might decide to bump that up or draw it down in quantity based upon your personal preference and understanding of that dish that you're making, okay? So, you know, your experience is going to go a long way in informing uh, your understanding as well as your decision-making process around uh, produce quantity. All right, thank you. 
And let's see, next up from Diana. Uh, can you discuss the difference between cooking on a gas stove versus electric? I have an electric stove and wonder if I will be at a disadvantage. Uh huh. Uh, no. Uh, my quick response would be: You're not going to be at a disadvantage. I think the you know the way we manipulate different technology is just a matter of our own adaptation right to that. And if you've been working with electricity, then you know you're probably pretty used to that. Um, now I'll uh, you know. I'll mention one thing, and you know, this part of this comes from my own professional cooking experience, which is about ninety-nine point nine percent of it was on gas. Um, but you know, there were a couple, three times when I was working with other chefs in their facility, and you know, in their in their building, they didn't allow gas. So we had, uh, you know, commercial electric ranges to use, which have these monster coils that really get super hot. But the issue, whether you're at home or in a, in a professional kitchen, is that, you know, when, when you want to modulate the heat, the electric coils don't cool down so quickly, right? And so the quick adaptation there is that you work at, the, at a higher temperature, um, to get your saute work done, for example. But if you need to cool the pan down, then don't worry about fiddling with the dial uh, to adjust the heat. Instead, simply pull the pan off the heat and then it's going to cool down very quickly. And then you, you can return it to the, the stove top or you know, the electric coil to continue with your cooking as needed. Okay. And so that's really the adaptation that uh, is probably biggest in my mind when I think about any differences between gas and electricity. All right, um, but uh, you know, otherwise, to you know, uh, you know, answer your question about any disadvantages, again, I would say no. Um, I have confidence that I could produce you know foods just as well on electricity as I could on gas, and I think you can too. All right, thank you. All right, next up. From Sarah, I would welcome your advice on getting the best texture for firm tofu when cooked to get it crispy and flavorful. Okay, so, um, you know, what comes to mind for me when, uh, you know, I'm working with uh, firm or extra firm tofu is to press it, all right, and uh, draw out that uh, water that it holds on to. And so you have the, the driest surface that you can work with, okay? Um, crispiness, right, is based upon dryness, okay? And so if you can give the tofu a head start by pressing the water out, then it's gonna give you the best chance of developing the crispiness on the surface. Um, some cooking oil is very helpful in developing crispiness. Uh, if you don't wanna do that, then consider a non-stick pan. Uh, um, and, you know, another uh, option is to flour the pieces of tofu to help develop a little bit of a crust, which can lend some texture to the tofu. Okay, so those are a few things to keep in mind. Uh, in terms of flavorful, uh, you might consider marinating the tofu, all right? So in uh, at least a couple of our courses, right, we talk about handling tofu in a little bit more depth. And one of the things that we talk about is to first press it and then to marinate it. And you wanna press out the excess water so that when you go to marinate the tofu, it will draw in the flavors from the marinade. And the marinade could be most anything, okay? You know, whether, you know, it's, it's liquid, uh, the, the coconut aminos or whether it's a soy sauce or something else. Um, it really is up to you um, to create the flavor profile, uh, you know, following through with some balance. Um, so, you know, often there's going to be acidity. Um, there may or may not be some oil. It's totally up to you. And, uh, but some, a little bit of a, a liquid to, uh, to help the other ingredients um, sort of evenly uh, uh, apply to the surface and um, adhere. Okay, especially if you have other dry ingredients that might uh, or, or chunky ingredients that might go into your marinade, like uh, grated ginger uh, or minced garlic 
or dry herbs and spices, okay? So a wet surface is gonna be helpful there, but uh, pressing. Uh, now, you keep in mind that, um, you know, if you're gonna marinate the product, you're, inter you're introducing moisture again, which means that you want to dry it once again, uh, you know, in order to uh, develop some crispiness. And so the oven, uh, you know, as a cooking method, right, the, the baking or roasting method works very well. Um, place your tofu in a sheet pan. Um, I recommend using a silicone mat uh, for two reasons. One, because the cleanup is easier than scrubbing on your sheet pan. Uh, and then also because silicone gets very hot and it will uh, develop browning and, and crispiness uh, a little bit easier as well. Okay, so give that a try and, and see how that turns out. Thank you. And let's see, next up. I, uh, yes, okay, this is from Mary. So I'm in the professional plant-based certification course and was wondering if getting a juicer is necessary or could I achieve very similar results using the Vitamix and a strainer? I'm not a big juice fan. That's too acidic for me. Okay. Um, my quick answer is no, a juicer is not a requirement. Um, I don't recall any of our assignments that require a juicer. There are some other uh, preparations in the course uh, for your practice uh, that call for juice and optionally then a juicer, um, you know, but certainly if you have a, um, a blender and you follow the, the manufacturer's suggestion, right, of adding some water uh, with a, a certain quantity of your fruit or vegetable and then blending it and then straining it, as you mentioned, uh, then you can create some juice, okay? Um, but uh, yeah, no need to buy a separate piece of equipment, right? Thank you. And next up, I am in the plant-based course. Does coffee and or tea fit into the new way of cooking eating? Uh, sure, I mean, absolutely. I think, um, you know, there, there's nothing within the rules of uh, whole food plant-based uh, eating that would preclude you from consuming uh, coffee or tea. So totally up to you, okay, to enjoy those beverages, all right? All right, next up. Uh, I treat this course as help for daily cooking. Uh, could you please suggest how to mix practice recipes from various units so that they build a full meal, dinner, or lunch? Uh, one from veggie, one from poultry unit, maybe. Um, yeah, so my general approach here would be to uh, take a look at the unit that interests you. Okay, whether it's poultry cookery or uh, soups or, or something else, and uh, take a look through the selection of uh, recipes, practice recipes uh, that we provide, and you know see how those suit your palate or the preferences of your family and friends that you're cooking for, and then think about uh, you know how you want to put together a menu from there. All right, so you know you might uh, you know opt for a, a vegetable. Uh, recipe and, and a, a grain preparation that might complement uh, your your poultry. And then in that way, you can put together a menu that's going to work for your particular setting. I think that's going to be very important here, okay? But my general suggestion would be to look ahead at the units that are of interest to you and uh, decide uh, what's going to be most appealing at that time, right? It could be based upon what's available, uh, you know, seasonally at your grocery store uh, as well, okay? So give that a try, and if you have further questions, uh, give a shout. All right, thank you. Next up, uh, I know I need both a blender and a food processor. Is it okay to have a combination blender food processor? Uh so just to clarify, when you say combination uh, blender food processor, I'm envisioning a single base you know, motor that has different fittings, 
you know, one is a blender, you know, one is a, a food processor, the pro oftentimes there are other fittings as well. Uh, it, and yes, absolutely. Um, you know, I would say, you know, take the path of least resistance for you, um, you know, in terms of acquiring the equipment that will work for your particular setting. Uh, I generally think it is uh, a good thing to have both a blender and a food processor because while there is some overlap, they do some different things. Um, you know, a, a blender is better for more wet liquids, whereas a food processor is better for, um, you know, less wet uh, purees, right, for example. And uh, so, it, you know, if the answer for you is to get a combination model, um, single base with different fittings, I think that's a perfect answer. All right, thank you. And next from Tracy. Uh, I would love a list of non-dairy cheeses uh, that are healthy to eat. Many store brands have ones that are heavily processed, or, or better yet, uh, will we have a class designated uh, to making non-dairy cheese from scratch using cashews? Uh -huh. Okay, so... Um, I think that I talked about this in a live event some time ago, and uh, there's going to be a, uh, an archived live event that might touch upon that. Um, but, uh, you know, otherwise, uh, yes, I, I absolutely understand and agree with you that uh, many of the store-bought options just have a lot of stuff in them. And, uh, you know, certainly if you were to make uh, some of these uh, you know, non-dairy cheeses on your own, you would have much more control over the quality of the end product. And um, there are uh, kits that are available. I, I will mention that as well. And um, gosh, once again, the name of this company is slipping my mind. It's a Portland, Oregon based company that sells cheese kits. If you were to Google cheese kits. That's probably the first hit you're going to get. Uh, their kits work very well. I've got experience with um, uh, several of their cheeses in their um, uh, in their non, in their vegan cheese kit. They all, they're all fun. They all taste good. Um, you can sort of play with them a little bit, um, but I do recommend that you work through them according to their recipes and procedures to start with so you can understand what it is that uh, is intended. And then you can, um, uh, you know, alter flavors and, and textures uh, from there. But that's a, a great way to bring uh, some of these products into your own kitchen. Okay. Um, uh, so, yeah, I'll, I'll leave it at that to, to take a look at uh, that option. Okay. And uh, thank you very much. Uh, moving on. Uh, let's see. Okay, great. It uh, looks like Patrick just listed up uh, an archived live event about non-dairy cheeses. So please start there uh, for some inspiration. All right. Next up from Patricia. Uh, I would like to suggest a class, even video segment on the site teaching about uh, produce varieties, right? So choosing, cleaning, storing, etc. Or can you suggest a resource? Uh, thank you very much for that suggestion. I would I, I definitely take these suggestions, uh, and um, uh, you know I talk about them with our colleagues here to uh, consider timing on uh, the the possibility of developing a short course or the addition of that information to a course. So I appreciate you you mentioning that, Patricia. Uh, now, in terms of resources. Uh, yes, there are a lot of resources on the interwebs. And, you know, for example, um, in the United States, uh, you know, most any of the agricultural universities will have some information on uh, choosing and storing produce. So, you know, I suggest doing a Google search uh, around choosing and storing produce, and you're going to get a lot of hits uh, on that topic. You know, also, uh, just a couple of months ago, uh, the New York Times had a nice article. Uh, this, is, this is from June of 2020, right, on this very topic. So you might take a look at that article as well online. All right, thank you. And next up, 
Uh, I bought a, a Hinkle uh, two-stage knife sharpener. It has a coarse and a fine slot and a handle. Is this a good tool for sharpening knives the proper way? Okay, uh, Christina, so a great question. I was just having this discussion with a friend of mine yesterday. And um, so uh, on one hand, yes, these um, uh, sometimes manual, sometimes electric uh, sharpeners that allow you to pull the knife through uh, these different settings, um, uh, sometimes there are two settings, sometimes there are three settings, uh, they are effective. And certainly if, you're, if your starting point is a dull knife, then most definitely uh, they are going to give you a, a big step up on your cutting ability in the kitchen. Um, however, it's my uh, experience uh, that, uh, in, that, that says that uh, using a whetstone will give you potentially better results, okay? Uh, however, uh, the challenge with working with whetstones is that there's a learning curve, all right? And uh, if you're gonna get set up with whetstones, then it's best to use them periodically because you need to practice to maintain your, your skills. And then also as you're starting out with whetstones, uh, use an inexpensive knife to practice on, okay? Because, you know, potentially you can really wear down a blade, uh, you know, as you move through, especially on a coarse stone. And you don't want to be doing that with your more expensive knives or your nicer knives. Uh, so those are a couple of things to keep in mind. But um, again, generally speaking, uh, the uh, m other mechanical sharpeners are effective. They're certainly much easier to use, uh, you know, than, uh, than stone. So it kind of depends on what your preference is. Okay. If you want to sort of keep things a little bit easier in the kitchen in terms of the maintenance, then absolutely, you know, use your, uh, your sharpening device and uh, that's probably going to be uh, fine. But if at some point you want to up the game and you want to fiddle around a little bit more with, um, uh, with your knives, then you might consider uh, whetstones. All right, thank you. All right, next up from Erica. What are your thoughts on using lemon juice from the bottle versus fresh lemon juice? Sometimes I don't always have lemons on hand. Uh, is it advised to use only juice or is the bottle okay to use uh, nutrition uh, value wise? Okay, so, um, you know, I will generally respond from a culinary standpoint, first of all, uh, the, the uh, juice in a bottle is usually pasteurized, which means it's heat treated. And so that's why we have a change in flavor. And um, that that fresh vibrancy is is it, it declines a little bit uh, in in the bottled product. So uh, just know that difference, right? If you use a, a juice from a fresh lemon, um, it's going to taste brighter, and that's really a personal call on on your part. Um, there is a difference, but uh, you know it's your preference and your tolerance, I guess, uh, that will. You know, uh, dictate your choice. From a nutrition standpoint, I don't have an opinion on that at all. Um, I guess I just don't worry about nutrition. Um, you know, I try to eat mostly whole foods, uh, you know, in reasonable moderation, and I eat a variety of, of, of foods. Um, so, you know, from that approach, I have full confidence uh, that I'm getting all the nutrition uh, that I need. Uh, and I think that's going to be true uh, for most people most of the time. Certainly, if a person has a particular uh, condition or concern that they're addressing, then they're going to know that, and they're probably uh, will be working with a dietitian or a physician to address that. So there are exceptions, um, but otherwise, when it comes to the nutrition of, um, you know, uh, lemon juice. Um, you know, I don't even think about that. It's um, any differences are probably pretty darn small. All right. Thank you. All right. Next up. Um, can you suggest a substitute for cilantro? I have a lot of recipes I'd like to try that call for cilantro. I do not like the smell or taste of it. Aha. 
So it sounds like you might have the cilantro gene. And apparently there's actually a gene uh, that some of us have, some of us don't have, right? That makes us um, you know, more or less sensitive to uh, cilantro. Uh, is there a substitute? Some would argue no, uh, because cilantro is uh, so unique and certainly with certain regional cuisines, you know, there is no substitute. Um, but the other part of my answer is, you know, simply to reach for another herb that you do like and that, um, you know, according to your palate is compatible with the dishes that you're making. I think the, the substitution is really that simple. Okay. Um, you know, otherwise there's you know, nothing that replicates the flavor and the aroma of cilantro. All right. Thank you. Uh, so Alan asks, are onion granules and onion powder the same? Uh, yes, basically they are, except for the size. Um, onion granules are a little bit more coarse than onion powder. So that's the difference. All right, thank you. Next up, uh, I'm not a fan of tofu. Is there an alternative if tofu or soy is used during this course? Um, it depends on the function of that ingredient. And so I'll take a moment here and, and uh, talk about ingredient substitutions, but after I take a sip of water. Ah, thank you. So uh, generally, when we think about um, ingredient substitutes, uh, regardless of what the ingredient is, we want to think about the function of that ingredient in that preparation. Okay, so uh, sometimes an item will add simply, you know, color uh, along with some um, maybe aroma and flavor, as in uh, an herb garnish to finish a dish. Uh, sometimes an item will add um, mouthfeel. Uh, sometimes it's uh, viscosity, you know, maybe making a liquid thicker or, you know, lending a, a puree, a nice uh, stiff body. Um, so we got to think about the function of that item. Now, uh, tofu can provide different functions depending on how it's used. So we can... Um, dice tofu, and we can add it to a soup for some texture, some visual interest. Um, you know, we can cut slabs of tofu and bake it um, so that it really firms up and, and uh, uh, plays the role of a, of a main component uh, in, a, in a preparation or a, a sandwich, for example. Um, we can puree tofu, uh, in which case it adds uh, some of the body uh, in a uh, pie filling, for example. Uh, so it just depends on how it's used. Um, now, in terms of some alternative ingredients, uh, certainly if we're talking about, say, purees, then, you know, I often think about um, um, other legumes. So it could be some white beans, navy beans or something else. Uh, that might be readily available to you. Uh, that can be cooked until they're fully done and then pureed uh, and then incorporated in that same dish. Okay, so that serves, uh, it's another legume, right? But it's not a soybean, if, if soybeans in particular are the concern here, okay? Um, nuts and seeds in their pureed form are a common um, you know, alternative uh, for, for soybeans, okay? So it could be cashews, um, you know, which are uh, fairly neutral in flavor. The difference is that uh, cashews are um, maybe a little bit higher in fat. So you might keep that in mind in terms of the quantity and the frequency uh, that you, you, you make that substitution, all right? So a few things to keep in mind. Thank you. Next up, uh, which oils are best for high heat cooking and could you explain smoke points? Um, so to answer part one, uh, the best oils for high heat cooking are refined oils. Refined oils have all the stuff filtered out of them. So um, it promotes a, a higher smoke point uh, in that oil. And a smoke point uh, very basically is the temperature at which 
uh, the oil starts to burn and you see smoke coming off of the surface. And, um, you know, you, you have a shift in flavor and color and aroma uh, at that point as well. And so it's typically desirable to stay below the smoke point. Uh, if we do get beyond the smoke point, um, very often it, it calls for the replacement of the oil. OK, um, if we're right at the smoke point, um, then we can you know, use that oil. Uh, there are certainly recipes that um, or, or um, I'll say times when we're right at that edge because we want the high heat and um, that's not a problem. OK, but if you're noticing uh, that a burnt flavor uh, and off flavor, then it is time to uh, to change the oil if, if we're frying, for example. OK, but uh, yeah, definitely use a, a refined oil. Uh, there are many out there to choose from. I'm not particularly uh, 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 I'm not a particular fan of a single oil, uh, but, just, but rather a refined oil uh, for frying. OK, or, or other high temperature cooking. Thank you. Uh, next up, uh, what advice would you give to newbies about uh, to start the 90 day FOK plant based course? Um, well, you know, general advice would be to uh, keep an open mind uh, to the changes uh, that you might be experiencing uh, in your diet on a daily basis or, or a weekly basis. You know, um, very often when we shift from um, a diet that incorporates uh, animal derived ingredients, um, butter, heavy cream, milk, uh, meats, and, uh, you know, we shift to uh, a plant-based diet, we often think about what's missing in the diet. Um, so it's really a mental game. In my opinion, life is 90% mental anyway. And so when we make the shift to a plant-based diet, if we can do our best to focus on what we do have in front of us, rather than what we don't have, on the plate, then it, it makes the experience much more enjoyable and much more tolerable, sort of kind of depending on uh, what's going on, uh, you know, with your experience. Um, so that's going to be the big one is to understand the mental component of this sort of a change. And that's going to be true of so many changes, right, in life. Uh, it's it's 90 percent mental. OK, and the rest of it physically, no problem. You know, we can we can get past that. All right. Hope the hope that helps, Jeffrey. Thank you. All right. Next up, I appreciate your knowledge of food safety. What temperatures am I seeking to cool soup stock? Um, okay. So uh, stock and particularly animal-based stock. Okay, um, uh, is going to be perishable. All right. And so perishable means that you've got a shelf life of about seven days, right? Um, um, for for plant-based stocks, about seven days, eh, give or take a smidge. Uh, for animal-based stocks, it's probably five, six, seven days or so right in there before uh, you're going to be noticing a shift in flavor, okay? And in terms of temperatures, okay, uh, you know, as I talked about earlier in today's program, uh, time left in the danger zone is, is, is something we have to keep in mind, okay, in addition to just time in the refrigerator, all right? So the, the, the guidelines in terms of the food code, okay, which is um, sort of the the, the overarching guidelines uh, that dictate um, food service operations uh, around uh, the United States anyway, okay, suggest that um, we bring foods down to at least 70 degrees Fahrenheit within two hours, okay? And then we bring the temperature from 70 degrees um, you know, down to at least 41 degrees within four hours. All right. Um, so it gives you a window of six hours, but it's broken up um, at the 70 degree mark. Okay. Because 70 degrees Fahrenheit 
and a little higher puts you right in the middle of the temperature danger zone, um, which is that warmer temperature range where microorganisms thrive. So we want to get the food item, whatever it is, stock or mac and cheese or whatever it is you're making, um, out of the temperature danger zone, okay, which by the way is 41 degrees to 135 degrees Fahrenheit. Okay, but we want to we want to get it out of the temperature danger zone pretty quickly, but certainly out of that mid range um, where microorganisms will thrive. Okay, and uh, so hence that two step guideline. All right, uh, and then you know we have uh, the chance to maximize shelf life in the refrigerator after that. All right, so I hope that's helpful. All right, um, thank you for that question, Sarah. Uh, next up, I see that there are lessons and courses. Uh, I am not sure if I should assign individual lessons or assign the course. Uh, I also wanted to know uh, that if they complete a lesson and it is part of a course, will it be credited in the course? Okay, so um, this uh, is a question right, for chef instructors that are using Ruby in their classroom, right? And uh, so let me look at the, the, the couple of parts here. So I'm not sure if I should assign individual lessons or assign the course. Okay, so um, that first question will depend upon your overarching um, uh, syllabus. Right. And, you know, what it what it is that um, you want to teach your students and then the sequence in which you want to teach your students. All right. So, for uh, example, our uh, pro courses are set up in a sequence that to us makes sense, even in the classroom. OK, so in other words, they start out with. Um, food safety and sanitation, they move into knife skills, they move into uh, basics of cooking methods, um, just as you would find in the typical uh, professional curriculum in an on-ground culinary school, okay? And that's because, um, you know, most of us at Ruby come from uh, on-ground culinary schools at, at some point in our career. So, you know, we understand the logic of building a course, okay, from a pedagogical standpoint, okay? Um, so uh, I think it's quite fine to assign a course and to allow your students to move through it in the Ruby given sequence, okay? Um, now, if there are certain units Right, and therefore certain lessons, certain learning outcomes uh, that you want to emphasize, and maybe others that are not included in your syllabus. Then, as you assign a course, you might, you know, explain to your students that we're gonna we're gonna omit this unit and that unit, but cover the rest of them. For example, okay, so that's going to be one approach. Uh, the second part of your question, um, I also wanted to know that. If they completed a lesson and it is part of a course, will it be credited in the course? Okay, so let me answer this in a couple of different ways. Um, you know, we do offer these standalone lessons, right? These are these short learning modules. Um, and so if, a and these topics are um, very often provided in a full course as well. Okay, so. Uh, if a student takes a standalone lesson or, or module, then no, uh, credit will not be given for that topic in a full course because it was taken as a separate entity, right, as a separate module, okay? Um, so if you're interested in, you know, these different lessons that thread together as a complete course, then I recommend the full course, okay? 
Uh, and if you have further questions, you know, please uh, give me a shout at uh, support at ruby.com and we can continue the conversation. Thank you. All right, next up from Billy. Uh, what brands of pots and pans, knives and cooking utensils do you recommend for processing, time saving and maximum cooking results? Aha. Uh -huh. So, um, you know, I am uh, not a particular fan of particular brands uh, of anything in the kitchen. Um, we have a hodgepodge of different things uh, that we use. And, you know, some are recognizable high-end national brands or, or bespoke custom um, one-offs. And some are uh, very inexpensive purchases. And um, so uh, we find benefit from many, many different brands. So um, uh, I won't make any recommendations there. Instead, I will say the most important thing you can do is to develop your skills in the kitchen, okay? And once you develop your skills in the kitchen, then it won't matter what brand that you use. Um, when it comes to purchasing th things for the kitchen, I mean, sure, I generally, you know, recommend that you, um, you know, buy decent quality uh, tools and equipment. And uh, part of that is going to depend upon uh, your, you know, your application, your frequency of use, um, the type of things you'll be making with those tools and those equipments. Um, so, you know, your choices uh, will necessarily be customized, I think, to your own situation, you know, budget, space allocation, type of cooking, et cetera. Okay. Um, but again, the most important thing uh, is going to be to develop your skill set. All right. And uh, then the brand of product will have uh, almost no significance at all. All right. Thank you. All right. Next up, I really appreciate your feedback on my first graded assignment. Last week, Ken mentioned that it is possible to interact with a particular chef directly outside the support email. Any chance you can tell us how to reach you directly? Uh, sure, you know, shoot me an, uh, a message at support at ruby.com and then we can continue the conversation. All right, thank you. Uh, let's see, next, uh, hello, um, hello, Kim. Uh, what type or material do you recommend for a good cutting board? Mm -hmm. um, well, I think there are a few different, um, you know, good choices. But let me first say, uh, or, or you know, touch upon what you want to avoid, and that is uh, particularly hard surfaces. Okay, so a, a couple of materials that I've seen that I don't recommend are glass and stainless steel. And now, outside of those offerings uh, in the cutting board department. I think most anything is fine. Um, wood, and there are different types of wood. Um, uh, maybe I should say plant matter because you know bamboo comes to mind as well. Um, within that spectrum of, of uh, plant, of, you know, material cutting boards, uh, there are different hardnesses, and some people get very particular about uh, what type of material that they want. Um, you know, I don't get too hung up on that. I think that if you're using any of those plant-based boards, uh, you're you're going to be fine. Um, I also use plastic, uh, you know, here at home, uh, at least from time to time, and plastic works quite well. And um, there are other sort of hard, I think it's kind of a foam, plasticky foam material that I've seen in professional kitchens. Uh, that work very well as well. Um, and so I think any of those um, are quite suitable, right, as cutting board material. Again, avoiding very hard surfaces such as glass and stainless steel cutting boards. All right, thank you. All right, so next up, uh, everyone is raving about the Instapot. What is your opinion on how this tool can be worth buying? Um, so in Instant Pot and, you know, other similar products from different companies, um, you know, is uh, an electronic 
pressure cooker. And I'm a big fan of the pressure cooker. You know, we have a pressure cooker at home. Uh, we use it every week. Uh, it's an old school stovetop pressure cooker. Works fantastic. Uh, it's just a matter of getting used to, you know, using it uh, relative to the type of food that's being cooked. Um, the Instant Pot, in, in, uh, Instapot, that's a, a brand, right, or these uh, other uh, electronic pressure cookers, take that learning curve out of the picture. Um, they provide a, a very nice uh, user's manual uh, that tell you, you know, how to program the equipment uh, for particular food items. And then you can practice from there. You can certainly fine tune the timing as you expand your understanding of the equipment and the foods that you're cooking. All right. So um, and, and the Instapod works great. Um, I've checked it out from the local library a couple of times and um, to acquaint myself with it. And I think it's a great piece of equipment. And uh, but but, you know, we don't need one because we already have a pressure cooker that we're, that we know how to use. Um, but I, I don't have any qualms about, uh, you know, recommending an electronic pressure cooker. Um, I don't know from a longevity standpoint, I can't tell you about uh, how fragile they are, how long they last. Um, so that's going to be uh, sort of a trial and error experiment, experiment uh, up, up to you, okay, to see if... Um, you know, it, it's worth the longevity, right, versus the price tag that you pay. Um, but, uh, you know, otherwise, cooking with it is uh, is pretty easy, right, pretty pretty easy to do. And it makes so many different things, too. All right. Hope that's helpful. Thank you. Okay. Uh, let's see. Steve says, so what's your opinion on the Instant Pot? I have one and use it every day, though sometimes I feel like it's cheating in a way. <laughs> uh, also, is pressure cooking a good way to preserve nutrients and does it tend to take, uh, or does it tend to take them away? Um, so yeah, I know what you mean by the cheating aspect. I mean, that, that's what technology does, right? So, um, you know, the more technology we use, you know, the less of our personal skill and know-how that we're using uh, in, a, in a certain way, right? So the, the cheating part of the cooking, I totally understand. Um, you know, it, I don't judge anybody um, on the equipment that they use. Um, you know, if you're cooking at home, you know, two thumbs up to you, regardless of what equipment that you're using. Uh, from a nutrition standpoint, um, yeah, I don't know. Again, um, you know, my approach to the whole nutrition thing is um, I don't worry about it. Um, I don't, um, you know, I, uh, you know, are, 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 is, is the nutrition profile changing? Uh, you bet it is, but that's, that's going to be true with, with any cooking. Um, do different cooking methods matter or, or in other words, is, is there a difference? Uh, sure. I'm, I'm sure there is. Um, but from a practical standpoint, it's really impossible to know uh, because there are so many variables based upon, um, the method and the food being um, uh, prepared and how we apply the method to that food, right? Is it a few minutes of cooking in this direction or a few minutes of cooking in that direction? Um, you know, that, that's going to affect the outcome. So uh, really, it's impossible to know from a practical sense, uh, standpoint, and I don't worry about it. I, I think just uh, enjoy uh, whole foods, eat a variety of them, and um, you're going to be golden. All right. Uh, great questions, though. Thank you. Okay, Ryan says, uh, what is a good substitution for cheese when making a vegan dish? Ryan, there is no good substitution for cheese. Um, I'm kidding a little bit. I think, um, you know, there are some plant-based cheeses, um, you know, that can uh, come, you know, pretty close, I think, in the, in the flavor and texture department, especially if they're uh, replicating younger cheeses and spreadable cheeses. And, and if it's melted in particular, then we can come up with some uh, alternatives that might be satisfying. Um, but otherwise, I tell you, uh, cheese is, the, is a tough one if you're looking to find a substitute for that in the plant-based realm. That's my opinion. 
that opinion is also shared by a lot of folks that I talk to. Um, but, uh, you know, again, you might try uh, the, this cheese uh, DIY kit uh, that I referenced earlier in today's program. Uh, it's a, 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 from a, a company in Portland, Oregon. And um, I forget their name right now, but you can find them uh, very quickly on the interwebs. Okay. And then they will provide uh, some, some avenues for you to make some of these softer, spreadable, and, and melty cheeses um, that are pretty satisfying, okay? But otherwise, uh, it's going to be up to you, Ryan, to, uh, you know, either uh, keep some cheese in your diet or just try to forget about it so that you're not craving it. Um, but I do understand the challenge. All right, all the best to you. Uh, okay, there it is. Yes, Urban Cheese Craft. Thank you very much. Uh, that's them. Give it a try. Um, next up. So being new to all of this, I understand that this is low fat cooking. Will I still be satiated? And will I be getting the right amount of essential fatty acids? I'll be uh, cooking all this great food. How can I get my kids to try it? Okay. These are um, beautiful questions here, Sarah. So let me uh, first, uh, say that, uh, you know, a whole food plant-based cooking, all right? Um, and I'm, a, I'm assuming that's what we're talking about here, all right? Um, is not necessarily low-fat cooking, okay? There are sub-genres of plant-based cooking that are low in sodium or no sodium or low in fat, uh, for example, but, um, you know, just as is, uh, you know, a plant-based diet is not necessarily low fat. There's a lot of fats um, that, you know, we can bring into our cooking, whether it's through the addition of oils, right, which we really are probably best to minimize, or through high fat uh, ingredients like avocados and seeds and nuts, um, you know, which are uh, uh, an important part of the plant-based diet, okay? So, you know, I would never tell a person to, uh, you know, that a plant-based diet was low fat, uh, or would I, nor would I suggest uh, a low fat diet necessarily, right? Because, um, you know, we all need our good fats. Uh, fats are an important part of a healthy diet for most people most of the time. Um, Will you be satiated? I think you can certainly be satiated on a plant-based diet, especially because of all the fiber that's present. And I think that's a big, big part to uh, the experience of satiety, okay? And, uh, you know, fiber is uh, beneficial in so many other ways. It is nature's broom, right? It uh, keeps us clean from the inside out. And uh, so, you know, that's uh, certainly um, will be big, uh, a big part of your satiety. Uh, in terms of essential fatty acids, eat your fatty ingredients, um, whatever those might be. And uh, again, eat uh, a, a wide spectrum of foods so you get all those nutrients and that's not going to be a concern. And um, how to get your kiddos involved. So, uh, or no, how will you get your kids to try it? The answer is... Uh, to get them involved. And uh, that can mean a lot of different things. And I recommend that you try as many different things. So for example, if you have a garden, uh, bring your children out there to dig in the dirt, to harvest the food, to watch uh, the blossoms open up and the little uh, you know, baby vegetables and, and things uh, form and grow throughout the season. Or take them to the grocery store or the farmer's market, wherever you buy your uh, you know, your, your ingredients and talk to them about the, the, the foods, how to choose them, why you might buy this variety over that variety, what the different colors translate to. And, uh, you know, let them hold the foods, uh, the fruits and the vegetables and uh, take them home and get them involved in the kitchen. You know, even the littlest kiddos at, uh, you know, age uh, two or three or so can uh, be a part of that process. They don't necessarily need to be handling cutlery at that age, 
uh, or working with the fire, uh, but they can be sorting and cleaning and doing other things that are part of that process. And in my experience, uh, it's with that involvement uh, in the, the bigger food process uh, that uh, we get their buy-in to also consume the foods. Um, you know, what, um, what better thing to eat than what I have helped make myself after all. And so I would uh, say, give that a try. And, uh, you know, I, I wish you success uh, with the kiddos in the kitchen. Thank you. All right, next up, uh, any suggestions on how to keep herbs fresh in the refrigerator? Okay, um, so, uh, you know, different herbs have different personalities and some are quite fragile, such as basil. Uh, basil doesn't like cold temperatures. So, you know, you want to, um, uh, you know, either keep it out at room temperature, uh, you know, in maybe in some water. Uh, if it is in the fridge, then I recommend protecting it, first of all, from the, the movement of cold air in the refrigerator, which means wrapping it uh, in a towel very gently. You know, also uh, keep it uh, maybe in the door because the, the, the door, right, as you open and close the fridge tends to be a, a relatively warmer place in the refrigerator. Um, and so that's going to be one thing to keep in mind. You know, other herbs like uh, rosemary and thyme, are rather hardy. And those hardy herbs uh, can handle the cooler weather in there, no problem. So you can put those in a crisper drawer or wherever is convenient for you. Um, and uh, another thing is that, you know, you might try to uh, stand up uh, bunches of herbs and a little bit of water in a container and store that in the fridge. Um, I have had success storing herbs in uh, restaurant kitchens, uh, commercial kitchens in that manner. Um, also another concern in the refrigerator is that that environment, um, pulls moisture out. So it has a de uh, an, an immediate dehydrating effect, uh, which means that for delicate items like herbs, it's usually desirable to wrap them in a towel, uh, and sometimes in a lightly dampened towel, uh, to, Number one, protect the product from the moving air in the refrigerator. And then number two, to restore some of the moisture that may be drawn out of that product. All right, so give those few things a try and, and uh, see what works for you. All right, thank you. Okay, next up uh, are the dried frozen herbs okay to use in these recipes? Let's see. Uh, so dried frozen herbs, I'm, um, I'm going to take that as possibly freeze dried herbs um, or maybe as dried herbs or frozen herbs as an option. I'm not sure. But um, in any case, all of the above are fine to use uh, in recipes, generally speaking. OK, um, my recommendation is if you are going to garnish a dish, just prior to service, that it should be with fresh herbs. And that's kind of a hard rule that I stick with personally, okay? Uh, just because it's much more rewarding to eat fresh herbs than to chew on dry herbs if they're presented as a garnish, okay? Um, but otherwise, you know, certainly um, herbs in most any uh, state, right, or mar what we would call the market form uh, are quite acceptable uh, in the recipes. All right, thank you. All right, uh, another question from Lorena. Uh, if I vacuum seal an MEP, example, diced veggies and tofu, to sell recipes, do you know how many days that portioned recipe would be good for, given that they uh, put it in the fridge once they get it? Uh, species and dressings do okay in basic airtight con airtight containers. Okay, so um, MEP. I'm not certain what MEP is in this situation, but I'm going to guess um, since you're using a vacuum sealer that it might refer to a modified environment or modified atmosphere packaging. Okay, 
uh, or a vacuum sealed product. Um, so the question is, do you know how many days that it would last uh, in the fridge? My, my quick response is no, uh, I, I'm not sure. I think it'll depend upon the food product. Um, you know, different foods uh, will react differently, uh, you know, to vacuum sealing. And uh, therefore, the shelf life can be affected. So uh, if I were in your situation, right, I would run some tests on shelf life relative to um, uh, well, there's a spoilage bacteria concern on one hand, okay? And uh, then there's also uh, a, a, a quality of appearance and a quality of, of mouthfeel um, sort of, you know, judgment call to be made. And so, yeah, I recommend running uh, tests, uh, experiments. So take lots of notes. Um, you know, get your, your given item, given dish or, or preparation and package up a few of these things. You know, maybe it's five or six or seven of these. And then you might open one each day and test it against the criteria that are important to you, right? It could be color, it could be texture, it could be aroma, you know, uh, flavor, you know, for example. Um, and then if you're interested also in um, spoilage, then we, you know, you want to push it out uh, to a point where the flavor starts to alter in a negative way, um, you know, i.e. the spoilage bacteria count has risen to a point where you don't want to eat it. So that might mean that you're making 10 or 15 of these packs and trying it one a day uh, across that period of time to see when you hit that mark. Then you know for that given dish what your shelf life is or what your recommended shelf life is based upon these other criteria, okay? And then um, I think regardless, you know, um, you, know you want to pull that back uh, and, and, and uh, recommend a much shorter uh, shelf life maximum for your particular product, okay? And then you would run tests like this on each of your preparations as you keep a notebook or keep a log with detailed notes so that you, um, that you really know your product, all right? So that uh, you, know, you can talk to your customers um, uh, and if they have any concerns, you've got answers and um, you, know, you uh, have experience, actual experience on your particular food. That's really important, I think, uh, in a situation like this, okay? Let's take a look at uh, the other parts of your question here. Um, yeah, I mean, some other things. Oh yeah, I guess, yeah, I would also look at uh, the ingredients in those preparations. So, you know, some things may be high in acid, uh, they might be high in sugar, and those are a couple of things that can extend shelf life <clears throat> or, you know, extend quality over a longer period of time. So, uh, you know, something like a dressing, you know, sometimes those things can last for weeks, right, without any concern. Um, but uh, it's good for you to, to be aware of that based upon uh, the presence or absence of some of these preserving ingredients, again, like acid that might come from vinegar, for example, uh, or sugar, okay? Um, but take notes, all right? And that, that'll be very helpful, okay? Uh, okay, so we got a clarification from Lorena. MEP means mise en place. Okay, all right, cool. Um, and uh, okay, gotcha, yeah. So I guess, I, I guess I'm answering the correct question here, really. Um, your mise en place is going to be for a a meal kit, right, for your clients, okay? So same concerns uh, as I have just addressed here, okay? Uh, you know, I think the, the color, texture, aroma, flavor, aesthetics are important, as well as spoilage. So those two categories of testing uh, should be done. All right, thank you. All right, next up. 
Uh, how to use an instant read thermometer for beef inserted from the side when cooking is stopped at the desired temperature, the meat is undercooked. And if I cook to 20 degrees higher, it's perfect. I am confused and have tried multiple thermometers. Signed, Lynn. Okay, Lynn, uh, it sounds like your thermometer needs calibrating. Okay, that's the, really the only explanation that I have. And uh, if you're using a digital instant read thermometer, uh, some of them have a reset button. And the reset button is, uh, it's either on the front or the back. Uh, it's sometimes just a very small little hole that you might stick a, the tip of a pencil in uh, to reset. And that's, uh, uh, that should get you back to uh, a baseline, um, you know, the factory reset where zero degrees equals zero degrees, you know, for example. Um, if, if it doesn't have that, then consider replacing the thermometer. Um, if it's a, an analog instant read thermometer, so with a dial, um, then you can adjust it yourself, okay? And I guess either way, it's going to uh, be a good idea to test the thermometer. Let me explain to you how to do the ice water test, okay? And uh, so you want to get a container. You know, it could be a, just a, um, a decent-sized glass of, uh, of ice and water. Um, you don't want the container to be too small, so don't, you know, don't, get a little shot glass, for example, but get a get a good sized tumbler. Um, fill it with ice first and then fill it with water. Okay, because you want that water to be at equilibrium. So at 32 degrees Fahrenheit, right? Or zero degrees Celsius. So you want the water to be as cold as the ice. All right. And um, put your thermometer in there and let it sit in there for eh, maybe a minute. And it should drop to the coldest temperature that it's going to record. Take a look at what the dial says. If it says 32 degrees Fahrenheit, for example, then it's calibrated. You're good to go. Uh, if it's off, okay, then you need to make an adjustment. So I, I'm talking right now about the analog model. If you, um, I'll use this as an example here. If, if the dial is at this end here, at, at the base of the dial is a nut shaped, a, a, a hexagonal shaped fitting. And um, if you still have the sheath, okay, that the thermometer came in, there's usually a little cutout, a hexagonal cutout in, in that holder where you can slide your thermometer down uh, and lock that hexagonal base into that hexagonal opening, put it back into the water, okay, into that ice water, and, and see that it gets cold again after, you know, maybe a minute. And then you can adjust the dial so that it lines up at 32 degrees, okay? And that, so that's how you would make the adjustment yourself on an analog instant read thermometer. One thing to keep in mind is um, on the, um, the, uh, the skinny portion, okay, of the, of the thermometer, uh, down here toward uh, the bottom is gonna be a dimple. You'll see a, a small dimple that's where the temperature is being read on an analog thermometer. So that needs to be inserted clearly down into the, the ice water in order for you to be reading the correct uh, temperature, okay? Um, now, if you have a digital thermometer, turn it on, put it into that same ice bath, you know, full of ice, fill up with water so it's, it's at 32 degrees, stir it, store the water, Put your, uh, your thermometer in there. Uh, for a digital thermometer, turn it on, and it should read 32 degrees. All right, so if it doesn't, pull it out, reset it, put it back in, 
and see if it's at 32 degrees. If not, then you need to replace the thermometer with a new one. Okay, so that's going to be my approach here um, to, to, uh, for your for any cookery. Okay, and then you should be fine. And then as you cook, for example, larger uh, food items, in particular uh, meat items, you'll have carryover cooking. So depending on the size of the item, you would want to uh, pull it off the fire uh, a few degrees before it reaches your desired temperature, your desired doneness. And, you, you know, you'll want to take a look at um, a reference to depending on how big the item is. Um, the carryover cooking will will vary a couple of degrees, five degrees, 10 degrees, 15 degrees, maybe. OK, so you can take a look at that information. Thank you. All right. Next up from Carol. Uh, is it OK to refreeze frozen blueberries if I put a three pound bag from Costco in an ice chest during a three hour trip? with ice and other frozen foods, uh, chances are they will be partially thawed. Do I refreeze or put them in the fridge and settle for mushy? Uh, so the quick answer is that anything could be refrozen, okay? Um, you know, what happens is, uh, uh, you know, when you buy <clears throat> that bag of blueberries from Costco, it's an IQF bag of blueberries, meaning individually quick frozen. That's why the, the bag is loose inside, right, as, as you feel it. As you th thaw the bag and you refreeze it, it's going to become brick-o blueberries as the whole thing fuses together, okay? So uh, in that case, uh, it's going to be more difficult to use the blueberries. So you might take those leftovers and store them in smaller containers um, that are convenient to you. Uh, and then... Uh, understand that once you pull those items out of the freezer later on, they're going to be mushy, right? Because that's what happens in the freeze thaw cycle, um, you know, with vegetables and fruits, but they're perfectly usable at that point. Okay. All right. Thank you. All right. Next up, I have a lot of food restrictions, no gluten, no rice, no corn, no soy and no beans. Okay. And I was wondering how this will impact some of the courses in this curriculum. Um, wow, okay. So uh, there's no reason why you couldn't go through uh, any of our courses, um, but um, it will require some discovery, right? Uh, in, in terms of, you know, how you might uh, work around some of your uh, uh, dietary restrictions. And, um, you know, when it comes to some of our assignments, right, uh, then we, you know, we can uh, work with you on a, on a case by case basis, uh, you know, as you find a solution to uh, that need, okay, that, that fits both sides, the learning outcome, as well as your health outcome. Okay. Um, Hope that's helpful for you. Uh, when you have those questions, uh, you know, reach out at support at ruby.com and uh, more details included will be more helpful at that point. All right. Thank you. All right. Next, uh, I'm looking to purchase a new food processor. I am focused on the Braville Sous Chef 16 and the Magimix 5200XI. First, am I crazy? Uh, is there anything better or how to decide between the two? Um, Lynn, uh, my recommendation to you, as uh, it uh, would be for any student, for any um, uh, sort of comparative purchase decision, would be to take a look online uh, at, the, uh, at product ratings and product comparisons, and then uh, read the reviews. Um, of both the, you know, I'll, I'll say professionals that are doing the comparison, as well as consumer reviews. Uh, and then try to make your decision based upon that cumulative uh, data, you know, for, for what it's worth. Um, you know, otherwise, I don't know. Um, I don't, um, uh, I don't have e either one of these products, and I don't know anything specific about them. Okay, thank you. 
All right, next from Lindy. Uh, I would like to know how to give tofu and tempeh a savory flavor without using much salt. Uh, I like to use tamari, but it contains a lot of salt. I have tried low sodium soy sauce and coconut aminos, uh, but they don't give that savory taste that I like so much. Aha. Uh -huh. oh, so uh, a couple of things at work here. So number one uh, is the mental game. All right. And so as we make the shift to a, a new food or a new set of ingredients, a new flavor profile, um, uh, the mental exercise will be for you to focus on what is present in the food rather than what's absent in the food. OK, if we focus on what is lacking, then we will never be satisfied. But if we focus on what we have, then we have the potential to always be satisfied. OK, um, so part two to my answer is, um, you know, th think about uh, other aromatic and, you know, flavorful ingredients that can bring some uh, interest and satisfaction to the palate. So, you know, if not salt, then maybe some other, you know, I'll say uh, strong flavored or pungent foods um, like garlic or ginger. Um, it could be spices. It could be fresh herbs. Uh, you know, these are examples of uh, foods and categories of foods uh, that can bring, um, you know, aspects of savoriness to the palate. Um, caramelization uh, is a, um, you know, a way of handling the food that brings umami, right, or a savory quality to the food. So to impart uh, browning uh, is a good thing as well. So try these things in combination, right, to find um, something that's interesting to your palate and then you know, focus on uh, the, the beauty of what is presented. All right, thank you. All right, next up, if I can't listen to this entire talk every week, how can I easily find the answer to my question on uh, the archive video instead of watching the whole hour or more? Um, you know, the, yeah, the quick answer is that, uh, you know, you'll want to uh, view the entire live event uh, and, um, you know, um, you know, I guess, uh, you know, one thing you could possibly try, uh, Brian, you know, is to scroll through the questions and, and to try to narrow down, you know, where in that hour or so we are relative to the list of questions. Okay. Uh, not an easy process at this point. Um, so uh, I do apologize, but uh, ask you to, to bear with that process. All right. Thank you. All right, Sunny. I uh, recently made the Ruby fresh veggie bouillon and reconstituted with water to make veggie stock for a soup and noticed it had a decidedly pickled aroma and flavor, assuming uh, this is normal because of the large amount of salt or uh, did something go wrong? Uh, good question. And um, I'm not uh, sure that I have the exact answer for you. Um, there's 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 a fair amount of salt, right? Uh, you know, in the preparation. So I'm, I'm thinking. I always think spoilage bacteria, right? When um, you know we talk about uh, flavors or or aromas going in funny directions, um, you know, salt is going to uh, you know inhibit the growth um, of many bacteria, but not all of them. Okay. And uh, so that risk is decreased, but it doesn't go away. So I think we should keep that in mind, right? So based upon the quantity that you made, um, the way that it was stored, how quickly it was cooled down, uh, you know, these, di these different factors that are typical to the uh, food safety and sanitation discussion, uh, you know, think about um, the quality of the product, okay? So there's some troubleshooting that we can do there. Um, salt has an opportunity, right, to alter flavors, right, as um, moisture is moved around 
uh, and textures are changed, proteins are altered, right? Flavors can shift as well. So that could be uh, what is going on. But I don't necessarily have a specific answer for you. But instead, you know, a couple of uh, things to consider, right? As you continue to troubleshoot. All right. Thank you. All right, next up, uh, I do doubt about some foods. I love strawberries, but here in the Netherlands, uh, they are pesticide bombs, uh, difficult uh, to find organic and expensive. Is it good to eat uh, despite the poison uh, or not to eat to prevent the pesticides? Uh, how do I find the balance? So this is... Um, this is a great question, and I think a fairly common question, right, uh, for, for many of us. And you mentioned strawberries. Um, you know, here in the U.S., uh, we often hear about a list called the Dirty Dozen. And at the top of that list uh, is the strawberry, you know, this year and probably for the last couple of years or so. Um, strawberries are grown with a lot of inputs, a lot of, um, you know, chemical inputs. And... Um, uh, so I, I think, uh, I mean, ultimately the decision is going to be yours. Okay. And, you know, you might uh, do some more reading up on, uh, on minimizing pesticides and as well as the effects of pesticides and just kind of at least understand the broader conversation. Um, you know, on one hand, you've got a scientific community out there that would probably say, that the pesticides are not a concern, okay? Um, you know, because they fall within acceptable uh, tolerances or limitations. Um, but it, it depends on where you are and, and what your perspective is, right? So for example, in the US, uh, the question is often, um, how much of a pesticide uh, is okay until I get sick? OK, uh, another perspective on that same question is uh, how good are pesticides for me? All right. So if you're asking how good are pesticides for me, the answer is probably mm, they're not right, as in zero. Uh, if you're asking the question, how much is acceptable before I get sick, as in before I see symptoms of, of illness, the answer is very different, right? So, um, you know, you know, think about that as you read about this bigger question, okay? So, um, you know, there's also the, um, uh, the reality that uh, plants, you know, plant foods, strawberries, uh, with all of the micronutrients and the fiber that they, pr that they provide are good for you. Um, so how you balance that is, is, uh, is a tough question, uh, but largely, uh, you know, it's got to be driven by your level for con of concern and, and, and uh, around pesticides, your, your acceptance of them in your diet, um, you know, versus some of the information that you read, okay? And, um, you know, so you, uh, you know, might consider uh, some of the literature out there. There's a group called the Environmental Working Group, the EWG, uh, that talks a lot about this topic. That's a place to start. All right. Thank you. Uh, next question from uh, Danielle. Uh, do you know of anyone who is a vegan nutritionist chef? Um, no one's coming to mind with those uh, three criteria being met. Um, they're probably out there, though. Um, probably few and far between, though, because those are some specialized uh, niches to fill. But no, I, I don't know anybody offhand that meets all three of those criteria. All right, uh, next up. Let's see, is fermentation of vegetables or fruits good or bad? And is it uh, something you would recommend looking into or stay away? Um, you know, I don't have a strong opinion either way. Um, I think it depends on uh, a couple of things, depends on the individual, right? And how that person's body reacts to those foods. 
Uh, it also uh, can depend upon the particular um, uh, approach to food, right? That you embrace. Okay, you know. So you know, for example, uh, you know the the Ayurvedic approach to food um, does not emphasize fermented foods. Um, you know, in, in large part because of the heat that it it, it can produce, and uh, you know, again how you act or react, you know, uh, to that is going to be a personal experience. Um, but, uh, yeah, so I don't, I don't have a recommendation either way. I would say, uh, listen to your body and, uh, you know, do some reading as well broadly, uh, to come up with an answer that best suits, uh, your own makeup. All right. Thank you. Uh, next up. I'm doing Chef AJ's Ultimate Diet Program, plant-based, no oil, salt, sugar, uh, focused on calorie density. Uh, I think you will be aligned with that. Can you talk about that, please? Uh, so, Stephanie, this is a really big topic discussion. If we could sit down over a cup of tea, I think uh, we could, you know, we can uh, have a nice uh, discussion about this. But let me um, share a, a couple of thoughts. So, um, what you're talking about here is what's sometimes called the SOS diet, the, uh, as in no salt, oil, sugar. And, um, it, uh, you know, is one that is uh, recommended sometimes for folks that want to address some, some health concerns relatively quickly because the, the results can be, uh, pretty quick when you eliminate those three categories of uh, of added ingredients, right, in food. So we're not um, not. It, it kind of depends on the approach, but we're not necessarily talking about you know whole food sources, right, of um, you know of sugar and fat, for example. But the addition of these things um, through granulated sugar or cooking oil, for example. Okay. Um, so the whole food plant-based approach to eating is uh, absolutely compatible, okay, with an SOS diet. Um, you know, I would uh, suggest that you not uh, necessarily shy away from maintaining balance, which includes uh, foods that provide fat, right, whether it's a nut or a seed or an avocado, right? Uh, or one that is sweet, right? Such as a peach, right? Or a young carrot. Um, now, if uh, you, right, or if, if an individual has specific concerns that they're addressing, and you're under the guidance, right, of a dietitian, right, or a physician, and working with an SOS diet, then, right, you're, you're best to uh, follow the, the guidelines of those health professionals. Um, but otherwise, when it comes to general eating, um, balance is important for all of us. And balance means an array of foods and not uh, eliminating, um, you know, any category of food for fear of fat, right? Or for fear of sh uh, sweetness or sugar, okay? Especially in that natural uh, context of the whole food, which provides a lot of fiber and, and which is really important because fiber, um, does so many things, right. Including, uh, mitigate, uh, the rate at which our, uh, body, uh, uh, digests, right. Fats and sugars and, and, you know, uh, brings these into our blood and, and so on and so forth. Um, so it gets to be, uh, a more in-depth, uh, and complicated discussion. Okay, but I think uh, if we're talking about a whole food plant-based approach to eating, absolutely compatible with what you're doing right now. Thank you. All right, Brian, uh, you're enjoying these sessions. I'm glad to hear that. Thanks so much. I hope that um, you know we're provide, providing some little uh, nuggets of information that uh, you can put to use in the kitchen. Uh, my turkey burger recipe is um, to to coarsely process the turkey thigh uh, after liquefying one third to bind. Okay, so uh, delicious, but not enjoying make it in food processor. Any ideas on using something other than that? So um, 
Yeah, I guess I'm curious to know what you're not enjoying about the food processor experience. Uh, if it's an unevenness uh, of the processing or if it's uh, too fine. Um, you know, I have found in the past that a uh, food processor can very quickly um, make uh, meats too fine and then the resulting product is, um, uh, is too dense. Right, it is a certain mouthfeel that's created or or doesn't hit the mark in the case of a of a burger. So you know, my thought is okay. So you've got the binder, right, which is important. So you have a third of that that you're 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 making fairly fine, okay, and then the remaining two thirds, try cutting it uh, by hand, right, with a chef's knife, and then you have total control, uh, and then you can um, you know use that one third binder, you know, mix it in. And then uh, I think you've got some nice uh, chunks in there that are interspersed. It's not too dense. And uh, you've got some nice mouthfeel as you, you know, bite into your burger. So give that a try, cutting it with a knife um, for total control. Thank you. All right. Uh, next up, I eat a lot of beans, but now I'm 17 weeks pregnant. And I've been uh, having lots of bloating issues when I eat canned beans, especially pinto. What can I do to make sure I get enough protein and healthy weight gain with a whole food plant-based lifestyle? So this uh, sounds like a question that, sh that ought to be directed to uh, a physician uh, and or dietitian. You were talking about a specific case here rather than a general nutrition uh, and general eating and cooking. Um, and so I would uh, direct you to um, a healthcare pro in one of those two categories, dietitian or your family physician. Thank you. Uh, does soy products decrease testosterone in men? Any health risks? Um, uh, George, I, you know, I think there's a lot of uh, literature out there today that uh, dispels any concerns um, with soy products. Okay, and again, I'm talking about a context of a balanced diet where we're eating a variety, a wide variety of foods, enjoying all that plant based goodness. Um, there, again, for most people, most of the time, there's no concern. And again, there's a lot of literature to back that up these days, too. Okay, um, I think in the past, when we have heard those sort of concerns, it's been these uh, situations where a person has been eating way, way too much soy, um, um, uh, or, you know, they're simply, uh, uh, you know, overweight and obese, right? And maybe have uh, maybe some, some, un, some un, unfounded connection that they're linking to, to soy products. Okay. Thank you. Next up, I have an old hike, uh, High quality knives. Is there a good quality knife sharpener you can suggest? Uh, you know, my preference is going to be whetstones. And, uh, you know, short of that, uh, you know, take sort of taking the time to you know, develop your skills on, on a whetstone. Um, you know, you might consider uh, finding a professional knife sharpener uh, that can, uh, you know, restore the edge on these good quality knives. Now, having said that, uh, you know, I will throw out a word of caution. Uh, not everybody that collects money uh, for knife sharpening is good at it, okay? And, um, you know, I was recently uh, conversing with one of our Ruby students who sent me photographs of her nice knives that she had sent out to a professional knife sharpener and they came back trashed. Um, just, um, they were put on a, uh, in my eyes, they look like they were put on, um, uh, well, certainly a, a, a stone of some sort that was way too coarse and uh, ground down uh, unevenly and just looked awful. So, uh, you know, you wanna uh, pick a professional uh, and, and look at their results, uh, maybe talk to their customer or two, um, to make sure they're a good fit. And uh, that person 
might use a whetstone or they might use one of these um, spinning wheels, you know, that they can then move the blade back and forth on. Either way, that's fine, so long as they have a delicate hand and the experience to, uh, to do it right, okay? Um, you know, as for uh, any sort of home uh, electric sharpeners, um, I don't have experience, uh, you know, with them, certainly not lately. Um, so I would direct you to uh, online recommendations if you're interested in that sort of a product. Okay, thank you. All right, next up, uh, is there a way to tell what ingredients uh, you're going to need beforehand so you're not running to the store all the time? So, um, you know, Kathy, I uh, uh, touched upon this a little bit earlier, so I'll, I'll touch upon it briefly right now. Um, because everyone moves at their own pace through our courses and because everyone has uh, their own dietary uh, concerns, sometimes limitations and, and quantity uh, uh, concerns in terms of, you know, the number of people you're cooking for, uh, we ask you to jump ahead um, a few tasks uh, and determine what you want to cook from the options that are presented to you. And that's going to be the, the safest bet um, based upon your pace, what's available at the, at the store or seasonally, any eating restrictions, and so on and so forth. Okay, just jump ahead a few tasks. Take a peek at uh, what's waiting for you. Right, thank you. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me for a second. All right. <clears throat> so if something is organic... That is to say, certified organic. Uh, could it be GMO? <clears throat> it could be, um, and uh, actually, it should be. Let me say, it should be, um, because it, um, at least in the United States, and this is probably true elsewhere, elsewhere, but at least in the United States, um, according to the uh, organics certified organics uh, guidelines, um, an item must be GMO to meet that, that requirement uh, to be certified organic. <clears throat> However, you know, there is, um, I mean, arguably some risk, um, especially with plants that uh, cross pollinate pretty easily like corn, uh, where we find the majority of that crop uh, to be GE, right? Genetically engineered. Um, it, it's arguably, more and more difficult, uh, perhaps, to find uh, corn that is not adulterated, right, with, um, uh, with, with some genetic engineering. At least that's what some people uh, would tell you, okay? Uh, but at least by definition, if something is certified organic, uh, it isn't GMO, all right? But in reality, there's a little bit of a window for concern in today's uh, agricultural climate. All right. Thank you. In creating your own recipe, how would you go about determining a shelf life? So, uh, you know, generally speaking, you know, any cooked food has a shelf life of approximately one week. Okay. And uh, th that's really the quick answer. All right. And then it's just, uh, I mean, other than that, uh, yeah, the, the recipe is not really going to affect it. Okay. Um, and certainly, you know, you can shorten the shelf life if you leave it out at room temperature for um, an, an additional hour or two before it's refrigerated, for example. Um, or if you place an item closer to the door of the refrigerator where it's relatively warmer versus back deeper in the refrigerator where it's uh, relatively cooler, right? Those things will affect shelf life. But the recipe itself um, basically won't affect the shelf life. Cooked food um, is gonna be at risk for spoilage. All right, thank you. So in the beef uh, bourguignon, I used beef bacon because uh, I can't use bacon. Uh, okay, as, as in regular, as in pork bacon, uh, but there was a strong taste uh, of cured meat, briny and smoky, uh, that would stick out during each spoonful. Okay, um, yes. Yeah, so you know, in a situation like this where we're using uh, a very flavorful, um, sometimes pungent uh, food item. 
uh, and, and it comes out to be just too strong, my first recommendation is to just cut it back uh, by about 50% and then try it out, see how you like it, and then make adjustments from there. Okay, so uh, take notes uh, so that you, when you find that spot, uh, you know, that quantity that's going to work for you, then you can lock it in and replicate that each time you make this preparation. Okay, thank you. All right, so uh, Patricia, so first let me say, wow, you all have changed my life in my kitchen. Excellent. Uh, it's, it's wonderful to hear that feedback. And um, uh, so good to know that, uh, that uh, you're enjoying the changes. Uh, I'm a healthcare worker, uh, not a chef, uh, but I can cook now. And it only gets better. Uh, thank you. Uh, now about my kitchen knife. It looks dirty, okay, with splotches. Uh, it works fine. How can I fix it? Okay, so uh, a couple of things come to mind, Patricia. Number one is um, to make sure that the knife isn't supposed to look like that. Okay, there are um, there are certain categories of knives based upon the way that the that the metal is, the blades are made, that actually look like that. Um, but if they're actually splotches, right, as you're describing, and um, this, it, they probably need to be polished out of the surface, polished off of the knife, um, you know, in which case uh, you might uh, look for a knife sharpening person or uh, otherwise somebody that has one of these high-speed spinning wheel polishing sort of uh, uh, pieces of equipment. And it, I guess it doesn't have to be a knife sharpener. It could be a, an automotive person or somebody else. Um, and they will often have a, a wheel that is a polishing wheel. And then, um, you know, you can, uh, you know, have that person put your knife blade up against that, uh, that polishing wheel and see if they can buff out uh, these splotches. And a good chance that your knives will look like new again. All right, thank you. All right, next up, I incorporate a lot of vegetables in my diet. What do you think of using a large capacity electric steamer that can handle different vegetables at a high quantity? You know, I think that's uh, that's fantastic. You know, any uh, of these tools or these uh, types of equipment uh, that fit your lifestyle, right? Your your style of cooking, your volume of cooking. Um, that's perfect, right? Uh, and that answer has to fit your situation. Um, so, you know, give it a try and see, uh, see how it works. Um, uh, you know, you might try borrowing such an, uh, a, a tool from somebody for a period of time to see how you like it. You know, in my case, our public library offers many of these kitchen things uh, on a uh, on a, on a, you know, uh, two week borrow cycle. So I get to check these things out, uh, you know, before you make the purchase, in other words, to make sure it's going to fit what it is that you want to do. All right. Thank you. Uh, can a Chinese style chef knife be used in this course? Uh, these look like a cleaver, but aren't necessarily for that. The bigger, heavier ones are, but the smaller ones are used for cutting vegetables. Yeah, you bet. Absolutely. Um, I know exactly what you're talking about, and I think that would be perfect for this course. No problem at all, right? Uh, let's see. Next up, uh, any suggestions for additives to create Okay, uh, to create the more rubbery texture of cooked egg white in a finished product. I am working with various ingredients, tofu, soaked pumpkin seeds, flax, egg white, uh, trying alginate, methyl cellulose, no idea uh, what or how much. Ha, okay. Um, no, <laughs> I, I don't have an answer for you here. Um, let's see here. 
Yeah, I mean, you know, you talk about uh, uh, methyl cellulose. Uh, so you're in the in, in alginate. Okay, so you're in the realm of um, some of the uh, uh, gelification technology. Okay, and I think that's probably your best bet, right? Is is to play in that realm. Um, Yeah, yeah, and you know, again, I'm not, I'm not sure just what, uh, what sort of texture you know you're aiming for, um, but I think, yeah, your best bet is to try, you know, your hand at uh, the, the the gelification technology, which you've touched upon here, and um, you know, you can you can adjust the formula to make more or less uh, stiff uh, uh, or dense product. And, um, but they're, in, in my experience, they're still not quite as rubbery as egg white uh, will get, okay? Um, give it a try and see if you come up with something that's satisfying. All right, thank you. So when bringing a pot of liquid to a boil, so water, soup, et cetera, is it okay to raise the heat to the max? <laughs> Uh, yes, um, you know, the, the general practice, right, that I recommend is um, when you've got something that's cool, uh, whether it's coming out of the fridge or out of the tap, and you want to bring it to a boil, let, let's say you want to bring it to a simmer, right, or a boil, okay, uh, put it on the highest heat and bring it up as quickly as you can, generally speaking, and uh, certainly with water, that's no problem. If it's a soup or something else, then you definitely want to stir it occasionally uh, in order to avoid scorching, right, or burning at the bottom of the pot, okay? Um, but, uh, yeah, otherwise, to bring it up to temperature quickly uh, is usually fine, um, usually desirable, usually fine uh, to do that, okay? Thank you. All right, next up. Uh, so perhaps the people asking nutrition questions might benefit from these references to trustworthy sources uh, to search any topic. Uh, okay, great. Uh, yeah, look at pcrm.org as well as nutritionfacts.org. Yeah, great suggestions, Hannah. Thank you. All right, next up, I have IBS and have to eat low FODMAP. Uh, I've learned some things about substitutions. Will suggestions be made for this? Uh, you know, in our pro plant course, um, we touched just a little bit uh, on on FODMAPs and um, a, a diet low in FODMAPs. Um, you know, beyond that, uh, you know, you might take a look at some more uh, specified, uh, you know, I should say specific resources, whether it's a dietitian or whether it's a book from the library that will touch uh, upon this topic area more deeply than we will in our course. Okay, thank you. And next up, uh, hey, Tony. Uh, this question comes from my 10-year-old daughter. And let's see here, I just lost the question. Where? Are... Okay, uh, I find that many dessert recipes call for too much sugar. What's the effect on the dessert if I cut a little bit or a lot of that sugar? Okay, so, um, you know, as we talk about making substitutions or, or altering ingredients, we need to think about the effect, right, or the function of that ingredient uh, in the preparation. So in the case of a dessert, it really depends uh, on the type of dessert that it is, okay? So um, uh, sugar can uh, be a means to uh, moisture uh, in a finished product. Um, it can, uh, you know, it can keep an item moist, uh, you know, through its, throughout its shelf life. Um, it can add uh, tenderness, you know, it, it does different things. Um, so it depends on what it is that we're preparing. Uh, in the case of, you know, let, let's start with a cookie, for example. Okay. So if you're 
starting with a, uh, let's say a mainstream cookie recipe and you, you find it to be too sweet. In my experience, you can cut the sugar down by 50% and you'll have a, uh, a pretty nice cookie in the end. Again, it depends on what you're what you're after specifically, but in terms of having some sweetness that's present on the palate, um, that allows other flavors to come forth as well. Um, I find that to be a pretty good place to be. Then you can always adjust from there uh, to, to better suit your palate. Okay. Um, but again, you know, for, for other preparations, um, uh, you know, it depends. So, you know, you might send us a question uh, asking specifically, you know, what's going on in your, uh, your example. Um, you know, or you might just give it a try and put on your, your food scientist cap and have a little bit of fun with some experimentation, you know, which is ultimately how I continue to learn in the kitchen. Uh, sometimes I don't have answers to the questions that you ask. And so I go to my own kitchen and I do the experimenting, and then I report back to our students. Um, and, but if you do the experimenting yourself, you know, you're going to learn so much more about that process. Um, you can always just uh, start by cutting back the sugar, maybe by 25%, see how you like it, see how the texture is affected, you know, the, uh, and other aspects of the, the dessert. And then you can continue to make adjustments from there. All right. Thank you. And uh, next question, how long are the classes? So uh, we offer a number of different classes. And if we're talking about, uh, let's see, I'll throw an example here. Forks Over Knives uh, is a three-month, a 90-day course. Uh, our professional plant-based course is a six-month course. We have a, a pro cook uh, course also at six months. And then uh, we have some others, um, you know, foods, food safety and, and others that uh, um, kind of fall uh, sometimes a little bit shorter than that uh, or, or approximately 90 days. We have a, um, a vegan desserts course, uh, the essential vegan desserts course, which is about a 90 day course as well. So it, it uh, depends on the course. You might visit ruby.com. Um, you know, kind of drill down into the categories of courses and then uh, read the profiles and then you can uh, understand more about uh, the duration, uh, the, the time commitment required on your part to finish the course. All right. Thank you. All right. Next up from Peter. Uh, uh, do you got any good tip on how to preserve vegetables longer? Fresh vegetables cost a lot in Norway. Second question, is there any big difference uh, from fresh or frozen vegetables and fruits? Okay, so uh, your first question here, uh, tips on preserving, uh, you know, I'll say fresh vegetables, right? Uh, it really depends on storage condition. And this is, um, you know, where I think going on the internet and reading a little bit about the optimum storage uh, conditions, you know, the, the temperatures uh, for certain fruits and vegetables uh, will go a long way uh, in, uh, you know, educating you on how to handle the produce that you, that you purchase. Um, you know, some things are sensitive to uh, the cold temperatures. Some are very sensitive to dry air temperatures. Uh, others are sensitive to heat uh, others are sensitive to ethylene gas, which is emitted by other produce items. So you want to store those things you know, uh, away from each other. Uh, so to, to know some of those tips uh, will be helpful for you. Uh, but there are a lot of uh, you know, food categories. So take a look online and um, then start practicing this in your, your storage. Part two... Uh, is there any big difference between fresh or frozen vegetables and fruits? Um, not really. Uh, I mean, from a nutrition standpoint, not really. Is there a difference? Sure, there is, probably. Um, but practically speaking, it's really impossible for us to know every time we're using these foods. Uh, is the difference big? Probably not that big. Um, and hence, I say, 
don't worry about it. Uh, you know, just eat a varied diet, mostly plants, and you're going to be fine. Um, now, when it comes to, uh, you know, cooking, the one thing to keep in mind with, um, you know, frozen fruits and vegetables is that when you go to thaw them, they're already going to be soft most of the time. There are exceptions like uh, peas, green peas, and corn kernels. Uh, they tend to, you know, keep their their texture very nicely, but most other things will become a little bit soft. Uh, so, you know, you won't need to cook them so much. You know, as you know, as you do sauté work, for example, um, they won't be suitable for uh, a garnish on a plate uh, because they won't have that nice fresh look, uh, like a frozen strawberry versus a fresh strawberry. Um, but those are minor differences. Uh, and, and, you know, you're going to discover that very quickly as you use these different categories of vegetables. But by and large, uh, either, either category is quite fine. Okay? And I think uh, your results will be wonderful, uh, you know, with frozen fruits and vegetables. All right. Thank you. Okay, uh, last one. Uh, when you submit a task to be graded, must you wait for the grade before moving on? No, Jill, you can move right on uh, down the path uh, to your next task. And, uh, you know, we'll get back to you in, um, oh, a couple, three days. Sometimes uh, it's a little bit longer than that, um, you know, depending on uh, a holiday weekend, for example. But, uh, yeah, feel free to move on through the course and, um, you know, we'll get that assignment back to you. All right. And it looks like that was the last question of the day. Uh, I want to thank all of you uh, very much for joining me today for my office hours, uh, whether you were here from the beginning uh, or whether you joined midstream. And I certainly hope that uh, you found some benefit in today's discussion. Uh, there were just a tremendous number of really interesting questions. And uh, until we meet again, happy cooking to all of you. Thank you very much. Thank you.